Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 44. The previous episode explored the marine biome of the open ocean, and in today's episode I'm moving towards dry land, to the coast, into swamp and marsh, where I'll move up through rivers and wetlands into lakes and ponds. So today's show will kind of be like an audiobook about an explorer who gets washed up on a beach and ends up wading through a marsh and a swamp as he follows a river and floodplains up to a lake or a pond. And as he travels, he explores and comments on all of the life that he sees. It should be a fun adventure, transitioning from the open ocean to terrestrial biomes in this episode. Wetlands and lakes are like an intermediate biome between water and land, where the ocean is all water and the land is, well, all land, your typical wetland, river, or lake combines qualities from both of these in some way. Various aspects of marine and terrestrial biomes are found in wetlands and waterways, and they involve interactions from both marine and terrestrial species, as well as amphibious species. Alright, so with that said, the metaphorical explorer finds himself washed up on the beach, and he begins the exploration of life in the various waterways and wetlands that shape the geography of our planet. The first biome is the coast, or the coastline, where the sea breaks upon solid land. In almost all of the world's coastal areas, marine life thrives in the shallow water that exists just off the coast. The sunlight illuminates the shallow ocean floor, and this supports a variety of photosynthetic life. Larger, more permanent rocks near the water might be coated in green algaes, while submerged areas are likely forested in kelp beds or seagrass. These kelp beds are like miniature kelp forests. Their growth ceiling is basically the surface of the ocean, and near the coast, that ceiling is really close. The result is a large number of thin, short kelp, and these create an almost fluffy, loose carpeting on the, on the ocean floor. There are also species of seagrasses, which are just like regular grasses, you know, regular carbon dioxide-breathing autotrophic photosynthetic plants, but they live entirely underwater. These seagrasses live in coastal environments where they have ample access to light. Then you have species of trees that live partly submerged, and these are known collectively as a mangrove, and individually as a mangrove tree. Mangroves are pretty common in tropical and subtropical areas, while seagrasses and kelp have a much larger range. All of these plants have a neat ecological function. They sap energy from waves and from currents. This slows the water and helps nutrients kind of settle out of it onto the ground where plants and other smaller organisms can feed off of them. Areas like these kelp beds, mangroves, and the meadows of seagrass are all complex and diverse ecologies. Marine animals love these places, like smaller species of fish and mollusk that can live and reproduce in the protection of the vegetation. The roots of a group of mangrove trees can provide an almost perfect form of protection for smaller fish, which live in them and swim through them like a maze. Species of algae, fungus, and worms, they also thrive in these habitats, especially in seagrass. And more than that, they're an important and vital food source for hundreds of larger species. Seagrass is like an ubiquitous food that marine species from across the world can agree on. It's consumed by big mammals like dugongs and manatees, reptiles like turtles, numerous species of bird that float or live by coastal waters, crustaceans like crabs and prawns, and of course a huge range of fish. These fish feed carnivorous or omnivorous birds, which live in nests on the dry land, on or near the coast. They're also eaten by carnivorous animals like whales, dolphins, sharks, and seals. These animals interact with each other, creating another layer of complexity to the coastal ecosystem. Sharks like to eat seals. Killer whales like to eat sharks. And humans have hunted and eaten all of them. Humans are definitely an influential part of the coastal environment. And we have been for literally thousands of years. The moment the first proto-humanoid reached into a lagoon or shallow water reef to catch a fish to eat, our influence on the coastal ecosystem has exploded. It's evolved into fishing towns, into fish farms, into commercial fishing, and we've even added our own special touch of, uh, of industrial-scale contamination, you know, with everything from bits of plastic to nuclear waste. Although, our influence has been relatively short on an evolutionary timescale. 
and life hasn't really had time to make any major evolutionary responses to human input. The most obvious influence we've had, in an evolutionary sense, is by putting a huge bottleneck on the populations of fishable species. Overfishing is a serious problem, and a lot of key commercial fish species have had damn near every large individual fished out, and this leaves only the smaller ones behind to breed and perpetuate the species. And as a result, the fish kind of become really small, like the average size gets a lot smaller. Drier coastal habitats begin to look like salt marshes, which are characterized by dense patches or clumps of vegetation, like reeds and grasses. These plants are all halophytes, which means they're salt tolerant. This quality is an obvious necessity for the salt marsh habitat, because it gets regularly flooded by the ocean tide. These plants live off of the tide in an interesting way. When the surge of water comes from the ocean and breaks onto the land, it's pushing a lot of sand and sediment onto the shore. These plants and their dense, sturdy root systems are able to break up the force of the tide waves, and this, this kind of shakes out the nutrients and lets the nutrients and sediment fall out of the current and settle onto the ground. The nutrients feed the halophyte plants through their roots, and they feed a host of other organisms like crabs, small fish, and all the algae that live in the environment. So, a salt marsh is a marsh. The name kind of hints at it. A marsh is a wetland that's dominated by herbaceous plants, or by plants that don't have permanent woody tissue above their roots. Just like in the salt marsh, this includes various species of reeds, sedges, and grasses, as well as the occasional woody plant, but that it, it's usually just a small shrub or a bush. Marshes are consistently described as an intermediate landscape, or a transitional landscape, because it includes the area with all of the smaller, softer plants as they come out of the water, but before you get to the larger woody plants on solid, dry land. Salt marshes exist in the coastal areas between land and the ocean, where saltwater currents bring sediment and nutrients that settles and feeds all kinds of salt-tolerant plants. Freshwater marshes, on the other hand, exist along the edges of lakes and rivers. These get flooded up semi-regularly when rainwater or river runoff causes the water levels to rise, and when the water level rises, it submerges the closest herbaceous plants while watering the plants that are at a, a higher ground, you know, ground that's not usually flooded. Where marshes are defined by the presence of soft herbaceous plants, a swamp is defined by the presence of woody trees and forest. Swamps typically exist along the floodplains of a river as it cuts through some kind of temperate or tropical rainforest. Some of the largest swamps in the world exist where the Amazon rainforest meets the Amazon River. The Everglades in North America is a massive swamp, as are the bayous of the Mississippi River's uh, southern floodplain region. The Tigris and Euphrates River feeding through Mesopotamia into southern Iraq has a large swamp at its southern confluence. Western Siberia is a giant floodplain that has really terrible drainage, and this has created huge, expansive swamps like the Vesugan. There's another kind of wetland called a bog, which is the Marsh of the North. Bogs are defined by several characteristic features. They have a relatively high water acidity. They have a low mineral content and a generally low nutrient content. They're also characterized by the formation of uh, peat deposits, and growing on top of this peat is a, a carpet of sphagnum moss. The last major wetland is a fen, which is kind of like a mix between a swamp and a bog. It has the woody vegetation of a swamp, but the presence of peat and the low nutrient water that's characteristic of a bog. Fens also tend to exist at mid to high range latitudes, kind of along where bogs tend to exist. Bogs and fens are more common at higher latitudes, while swamps and marshes are common. They're common all over the place, but generally they're more common closer to the equator, where it's more humid. All wetlands are dependent on the floodwaters that come in and keep the land wet. As flooding is hugely influential and literally transformative for the environment, the frequency and duration of the flooding determines many aspects about the wetland, which in turn influences what kinds of life can live there. Obviously, flooding will destroy smaller, weaker plants, and it'll drown out all of the burrowing mammals, lizards, and insects. Flooding pushes larger fauna out of the local ecology, 
which reduces the quantity of vegetation consumed, and this encourages plant rebound. More flooding from the ocean means more sediment and salt is deposited in the ground, which may help or hinder the growth of other plants, depending on whether they're uh, halophytes or, or not. Wetlands like swamp and marsh are ideal habitats for amphibians, which are named after their amphibious nature. Part of their life cycle takes place on dry land, and part of it takes place underwater. And in maturity, they move about in both aquatic and terrestrial environments. The amphibians can thrive in the shallow, muddy water without being bothered too much by the relatively low oxygen content. After all, they can handle being out in the open air where oxygen is available at no cost, and they can even breathe through their skin. So amphibians have pretty much adapted perfectly to fit into the ecology of, uh, of your typical wetland environment. The frogs, toads, newts, and salamanders that all live in the wetlands consume pretty much everything that's smaller than them. They've evolved a simple mechanism for finding food. If they see movement, they make an attempt to catch and eat it. Amphibians have a relatively low metabolism, so their hunting is somewhat slow motion. For most of the time, the frog or the salamander will stay relatively still. They simply sit and wait for something to wander around it, like a fly that flies too close, or a spider that emerges from its burrow, or an earthworm that rustles some leaves on the ground, you know, or maybe a small fish that comes too close to the, to the amphibian. The moment the amphibian registers these other organisms, the moment it sees them moving about or crawling, it juts out its tongue, or it, it jumps at them. It just makes an instinctive, reactive, burst-like explosion of energy. This way they can still catch stuff, but they're really minimizing their energy expenditure. And this is important when you have, uh, when you have a low metabolism. Because they eat a lot of stuff, amphibians have a lot of ecological functions, which are really important for the stability and health of their habitat. For example, amphibians lay their eggs in the water, and when their larvae are born, they swim around and eat up algae. This top-down regulation keeps the algae in check. Otherwise, the algae population would grow rapidly in the swampy environment, and they would consume all of the oxygen in the water as they grew and reproduced. After the unchecked algae uses up all the oxygen for their growth and respiration and stuff, there's no more oxygen in the water. The water has become anoxic. All the fish die, and even the amphibians struggle to survive. The presence of amphibians, and thus the presence of their larvae in the water, means that there's a mechanism to keep the algae in check, and at least that variable of the ecosystem is stabilized. In turn, the numerous little amphibians that live in the wetlands get preyed upon by larger animals. Predatory reptiles like snakes really enjoy eating amphibians, and sometimes amphibians will even cannibalize each other. In most cases, you'll have like a, a, a large wading bird, and they'll come striding through the reeds of a marsh, and they'll peck down with their really long beak and pull a frog out of the water. Wetlands near rivers include habitats like floodplains and river deltas. During most of the year, a river has a relatively steady size, and it flows within well-defined riverbanks. But occasionally, when there's a heavy rainfall that inundates the ground with water, the river swells. The water level rises past the normal bank and floods the nearby ground area. These floodplains are capable of seasonally or temporarily sustaining complex ecosystems, which depend on that burst of flood water to bring nutrients and to saturate the higher, drier ground with water. During dry seasons, or periods with no flooding, the floodplain often becomes really dry and barren, with maybe a handful of dormant shrubs, some grasses, and maybe a tree or two. But until the floods come, most of the landscape is just its too dry to sustain a large, complex ecosystem. But when the flood water does come, plus all the silt, sediment, and nutrients that it brings in, it enables an explosion in vegetation. Fast-growing hydrophilic plants quickly emerge, and the wet soil gets permeated with funguses and numerous species of bacteria and microbe. The wet, nutrient-rich soil is really fertile for this kind of life. And this sets up like a, a really rapid initial uh, ecological community. As I've said before, where life exists, uh, it makes it easier for more life to exist. And so these plants attract animals that want to live in or use the plants as protection, or they want to feed off of the plants. 
New plants can then come in and grow in response to the animal's behavior. So you start to see the really rapid emergence of these complex ecological relationships. River deltas are also inundated with water, and they also get flooded during heavy rains. So the land gets just as much nutrients and sediment as the floodplains, and many of the same herbaceous plants that grow in floodplains also grow in river deltas. The river delta is basically a floodplain that borders a larger body of water. The hydrophilic plant growth creates a physical habitat for amphibians and birds, and depending on the climate, even reptiles. Little mammal rodents may burrow into the ground, stabilized by root systems, while frogs and toads live in the wetter depressions. Alright, so at this point, the metaphorical explorer has awoken on the beach. He's explored a marsh and a swamp and the floodplains of a river. If the explorer moves upriver by walking along the riverbank, he'll be walking through a type of biome called a riparian zone. This is a unique kind of biome that exists only along the edges of a river, fed by the water and sediment that the river provides. Where the river feeds the plants, the plants in turn help shape the river. The roots of trees and large plants keeps the soil on the riverbanks together, which prevents washout from flooding and rain, as well as creating hard points in the soil that the river actually flows around. All of these roots and stabilized clumps of soil, they sap energy from the water current as it flows across the landscape. This slows the river current, it slows it down, and it makes it more likely for sediment to lose its momentum and, and accumulate at the river bottom. The vegetation in the riparian zone is thus influential on the shape and the flow pattern and even the speed of the river. This vegetation includes various species of herbaceous perennials like sedge, uh, rushes like bulrush and spike rush, uh, ferns like wood ferns, sword ferns, and goldback ferns, um, various species of grasses, and a handful of flowering plants. Larger plants in the riparian zone include shrubs like dogwood and vine maple, as well as numerous species of berry-producing plant, like blackberries, snowberries, gooseberries, and raspberries. The riparian zone is also really fertile for trees, like redwoods, willows, oak, aspen, maple, sycamore, cottonwood, among many, many others. It's largely these trees, with their huge, heavy, extensive root systems, that are able to really strongly solidify the soil, and they create those winding bends that you see in the river pattern as it flows through a heavily wooded area. In some areas of the river, the water is slowed enough that there might be little pockets or lagoons of standing water. These places are like dense pockets of ecological activity. The small pool of standing water is surrounded by plants, usually choked by trees and covered in grasses, reeds, and shrubs. Pretty much all the rocks and uh, non-dirt surfaces are covered in algae. You might see algae floating on the surface of the water as well. The standing water presents a relatively safe environment. You know, you don't have the waves or the turbidity or the current to wash away anything. And so a lot of species find an opportunity to lay their eggs in standing water, like insects, amphibians, and fish. The insects typically lay their eggs underwater, on or protected by some piece of submerged vegetation. These hatch and the insects crawl from their eggs to either swim in the water or fly or crawl around the plants on drier land. These insects are a food base for the frogs, toads, salamanders, newts, and any fish or reptiles that happen to be living nearby. Fish will also feed on the insect eggs, as well as the amphibian eggs, and then they'll lay their own eggs. And the fish eggs are often eaten by uh, amphibians or reptiles. There's a lot of egg eating going on here, and so a lot of species, you might have noticed, have adapted to lay a lot of eggs. They're going for quantity over quality because there's so many predators and so many ways for the eggs to die or get consumed that if you want to reproduce successfully, you just got to gamble. You just got to make a ton of babies and just hope that at least a handful of them survive to reproduce on their own. The fish that live in rivers are often diadromous, which means they migrate between the freshwater river and the saltwater ocean at some point in their lives. You've probably heard of the fish that come from the ocean to return to the river where they were born so that they can spawn and die. These are called anadromous fish. The most well-known is probably the salmon, 
They spawn in lagoons or still water runoff areas, and when the larvae are born, they spend a brief period of time eating algae and insects and growing before they migrate downriver and out into the ocean. Other species of fish migrate in the opposite direction, living their lives in the freshwater rivers before migrating out to the oceans to spawn. The most commonly referenced catadromous fish seems to be a kind of eel from the genus Anguilla. The Amazon River is the largest river in the world, running through the largest tropical rainforests in the world, making it one of the most biodiverse regions on the planet. The Amazon River is packed with marine species like fish, crabs, prawns, and turtles. There are thousands of species of fish that live and die in the river, including the huge, torpedo-shaped arapaima fish. These things are really big, reaching nearly 10 feet or 3 meters in length, with long fins running down the back half of their bodies, and a head and a jaw that's shaped like a giant scoop. They're a type of mouth brooder, which means that after their young are born, but before they're strong enough to fend for themselves, the male fish will keep the offspring safe by storing them in his mouth. The female fish will stay nearby, and she actively wards off predators and keeps the male safe, so their little offspring enjoy two levels of protection from both parents. The arapaima are top predators in their river environment, swimming around and eating smaller fish, crabs, and prawns. They'll even eat land animals that wander too close to the water's edge, with the arapaima bursting out to grab the poor rodent or reptile or bird and drag it back down underwater. The Amazon River is often muddy and oxygen poor, as are many of the oxbow lakes formed when deposited sediments redirect part of a river and leaves behind an isolated pond-like river fragment. The nearly anoxic conditions created an evolutionary pressure for better oxygen acquisition, and so the arapaima and its cousin species like the piraruku and the peish adapted to breathe oxygen right out of the air like a mammal. They still have fish gills, and they still use them for a limited kind of aquatic respiration, but there's just not that much oxygen in the water, and so they're dependent on the air to satisfy their total oxygen needs. The arapaima fish have a labyrinth organ, which is filled with tiny blood vessels, and this highly vascularized organ is exposed to the air when the fish opens its mouth out of the water. Air diffuses into the veins, and this acts almost like a rudimentary lung to get oxygen into the fish's body. Recall that amphibians also thrive in these low-oxygen water systems, which is one of the reasons why the Amazon rainforest is home to thousands of species of frogs, salamanders, and other amphibians. Other predator fish in the Amazon River include the silver arowana, which is like a smaller version of the arapaima. And of course, there's the terrible piranha that gets featured so often in bad horror movies. Although there are several dozen species of piranha, only a few of them really kind of have a taste for human flesh. In general, piranha are omnivorous fish. They forage on various plants when other food sources are rare, but they prefer to eat various marine bugs like insects, uh, insect eggs, uh, worms, and occasionally a smaller crustacean. Although piranha have this reputation for being ferocious, flesh-eating predators, this isn't actually the case. Piranha are timid. They're afraid of danger. And they're mostly foragers, scavengers. In times of plenty, they eat plants, or any of the numerous insects, worms, spiders, slugs, and snails that grow on and around the plants. Prana will occasionally form schools or shoals, but these aren't typically formed for the purpose of group hunting. Instead, these larger groups of piranha, they form as a kind of defense against predators. On their own, a typical piranha is relatively small. They're vulnerable to being snatched up and eaten by any larger predatory fish, like the arapaima. When they swim in larger groups, however, they're much more intimidating. They seem larger, they, they present a larger biomass, and individual fish are harder to identify and track. The common trope about a horde of piranha descending on a cow or a person and stripping the flesh off their bones in minutes is largely an exaggerated myth. It's been known to happen, I mean, yeah, it has happened, but it's really rare. This kind of frenzied feeding behavior occurs only in rare circumstances, when the piranha are starving and when they're annoyed by some disturbance. It, it's like they just 
it really only happens when you catch the piranha on a bad day and they're really hangry. You know, they're hungry and you come in and agitate their water and annoy them and you make them mad. That's when they'll gang up and really just eat the flesh off your bones. But it, that doesn't happen often at all. It's much more likely that instead of a person, it's just like a cow wading across a tributary that would cause enough, uh, enough agitation to enrage a hungry school of piranha. But even then, that doesn't happen too often. Prana are actually rather shy and timid in the face of larger organisms. In that sense, they're kind of a lot like vultures. They just want to stay on the sidelines, away from any major action, and staying away from any major threats. And when all the larger organisms leave, they'll come in and scavenge the leftovers. Alright, so the metaphorical explorer is moving upriver observing all the plants and animals in the riparian zone, and observing all of the fish and hydrophilic plants hanging out in the water. After following the river for some time, the explorer might eventually come to a lake or a pond. These are inland bodies of water that usually have a number of rivers that feed water in or drain water out, although sometimes in the case of ponds, which are smaller, they're created when a flooding comes through and then dries up or washes away, and there's like just residual water left in depressions in the geography. There may not be a river feeding into or out of a pond. A pond may just be a really big puddle. One of the most important features of these uh, big puddles, of these lakes and ponds, is their stillness. The water in a lake has a weak current. It moves slowly, if it moves laterally at all. There is, however, a lot of vertical movement of water currents based on temperature, and this is vital for the biota that exists in the water body. So in the summer, the ample sunlight warms the air, and both the sunlight and the warm air subsequently warm the upper layers of the water. The deeper water isn't exposed to the sunlight or the warm air, and so it generally stays cold and still and dense at the bottom of the lake. The warm water at the shallower depths sits above the persistent pocket of colder water, above the thermocline, and this persists until the fall, when the air temperature gradually cools down. At this point, when the upper and lower layers of the lake have a near enough temperature, the thermocline dissolves and water circulates from top to bottom. This creates a cyclical effect called an upwelling, or lake turnover, which is a vertical current that sweeps nutrients from the lake bed up into the open water, where it feeds the plankton and plants and other organisms near the surface. As the fall progresses and winter comes, and the winter season progresses, the upper layer of the lake freezes over. Another thermocline is established. The area immediately under the ice is cool, but warmer water that was cycled down during the late fall will actually tend to stay near the bottom. As winter ends and spring comes about, the ice melts, and this exposes the surface water to the warming air. Again, this dissolves the thermocline and creates another upwelling event as the top and bottom layers of the lake kind of reach similar temperatures. In this way, seasonal temperature changes cause lakes to cyclically flush nutrients upwards into the open water for all the other organisms to feed off of. These upwelling events are really important for lake ecology and stability. Some of these nutrients will feed the thriving bacterial communities that live in ponds and lakes. These bacteria form mats on the lake bed, they form biofilms on the rocks near the shoreline, and they float around in every cubic centimeter of the water. There's microbes like phytoplankton and paraphytic algae, where the phytoplankton live in the photic zones of the lake, you know, where they can access sunlight to make energy and produce oxygen. And the paraphytic algae prefer to live on the sandy, muddy substrate of the lake bed where they can derive nutrients from the sediment. These microbial species are major oxygen producers. They cycle carbon dioxide, and they feed enough oxygen into the water to support larger organisms like fish and amphibians. The plants in a lake are often fast-growing, herbaceous plants. Because the fresh water is much denser than air, these aquatic plants don't need to invest that many resources in growing thick stems and a sturdy body structure. They don't need to support themselves because their natural buoyancy keeps them from falling over or from sinking in the water. They float, naturally. Some of these aquatic plants are rooted in the substrate at the bottom of the lake, while others are free-floating. Some reach up to the surface of the water and emerge into the open air while other lake plants will live and die entirely submerged underwater. 
Feeding off of these plants are numerous fish and amphibians, as well as herbivorous reptiles like lizards and turtles. While these animals are the primary consumers, you know, because they, they munch on the aquatic plants, they also invite predatory animals to come in and hunt them down. These predators include various species of carnivorous fish, as well as snakes and alligators. I want to take a minute to talk about alligators, because they're pretty hardcore predators that live in every biome I've talked about today. And they're just super badass in general, and I want to talk about them. So to get started, the two extant species of alligators have a relatively small range, with one species living across the southeast and south-central U.S., and the other species living along the Yangtze River in China. Although the, the species in China, it, it, it's so endangered that it's bordering on extinction. There's more Chinese alligators living in captivity, like in zoos or in private homes, than there are living in the wild. But in the U.S., alligators number in the millions. They're a really important apex predator and ecological regulator. So when they're first born, the tiny alligators practice their hunting skills by preying on fish and crabs and snails and other small pieces of meat like lizards and rodents. Naturally, they begin to attack larger prey, as they themselves grow larger, and their meals begin to include larger fish, larger reptiles, and larger rodents. In fact, more aggressive or hungry alligators will even attack large carnivores like dogs and bears. The alligators are able to handle the violence and power of these larger prey animals because they themselves are violence and power incarnate. Alligators have evolved a powerful U-shaped mouth, which can bite down on prey with a crushing force of several thousand pounds per square inch. Interestingly, while the muscles that close the mouth are really, really strong, the muscles that open the mouth are relatively weak. So weak, in fact, that you or I could easily hold an alligator's mouth shut with our bare hands. A characteristic aspect of alligator predation is the so-called death roll, or the death spiral. Because alligators have a slow metabolism, much like amphibians, they have to find ways to maximize their hunting effectiveness. They have to maximize the energy efficiency of hunting and killing prey. As a result of this evolutionary pressure, they've adapted to make sudden, rapid jerking movements to capture a prey animal before it even realizes what's going on. This is why if you see alligators out in the wild, or if you watch uh, a documentary that features an alligator hunting, you'll often see them lying very still or floating on the surface of the water, kind of like a log. The reason they do this is because they have a low metabolism, and they, they can't expend that much energy. They can't chase animals down, so they have to kind of lure the animal to them. They want to lull animals into a false sense of security, so they come close enough for the alligator to snap out and bite it. The death roll is a tactic that's used to kill larger prey that can't be killed with a single bite. You know, if you have a, a smaller prey animal, like a bird or a fish, if an alligator catches it, they can pretty much kill those animals with the force of a single bite. But larger animals, like deer or bears, require a little more creativity to bring down. The alligator will make its attack. It strikes out with its jaws, and it clamps down on a limb or the neck or the tail of the prey animal. The animal is unable to escape the terrifying grip of the alligator's jaws, but the alligator can't kill the animal without inflicting more damage. It can't open its mouth to take another bite, because then if it opens its mouth, the animal is just going to run away. So how does the alligator keep its mouth closed, but still inflict more damage so that it can kill this larger prey animal? This is where the death roll comes in. The alligator uses its tail as a fulcrum to start spinning and twisting. The jaws aren't moving. They're not letting go. So when the 800-pound alligator starts twisting, the limb that it's captured, or the part of the prey animal that it's captured in its jaws, is going to start twisting too. Within moments, the alligator has twisted and ripped off the limb, causing catastrophic damage to the prey animal. With its limb ripped off, or its neck or its belly ripped open, the animal is doomed. It's easy prey for the alligator, who can now conserve energy by just sitting back and waiting for the animal to bleed to death. Once dead, or once it's so maimed that it can't get up and run away or fight back, the alligator moves in and begins to eat. Besides the fact that they're super awesome, I wanted to mention alligators because they live in almost every environment I've talked about today. 
Alligators live along the coasts in Louisiana, Georgia, and Florida. They live in the swamps and marshes of those states, as well as the marshes and swamps all across the south central United States. And they live in the riverbanks of the Mississippi River and many other rivers. And they hang out around freshwater lakes and ponds. Alligators are right there next to the amphibian, as symbols of the wetland biome. Alright, well, that should cover just about everything that I wanted to talk about today. Our metaphorical explorer began his journey on the coast. He woke up on a beach, and he moved through a marsh, through a swamp, through wetlands. He walked up a river, through the riparian zone, where he made his way to a lake. And he made observations about the life that lived there at every step along the way. So you, as the listener, are kind of like this explorer. You've followed my narration of the wetlands of the world, you've gone on this audio adventure with me, and we've explored these biomes, from the coast all the way inland to lakes and ponds. I hope this episode taught you something cool, or something that you found really interesting. I hope uh, maybe you found something really fascinating and you want to go and learn more about it. In a more general sense, I hope you enjoyed this episode as the educational adventure that it was. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below. 